What's up, world? It's Coach Banta again, coming at you guys with week four, day one. So today I'm going to discuss uh, the critical mass system and how our workouts work out. Now, I do have to warn you, if my kids come running in, I got two tiny tornadoes that have been running through my house um, the last couple of weeks, obviously, because of us being quarantined and being locked in our houses and all the stuff that we have to do right now with the craziness that's going on in the world. But anyway, um, when we're looking at this workout, a couple things I want to highlight. First of all, our warm-ups actually get longer um, as we move throughout. So what I like to do is go up three and unload one. And so eventually what happens is, is that my athletes will get to a point <clears throat> where the volume in their warm-up gets pretty large. However, we move that up and down just like we move everything else up and down, as I previously explained. Also, uh, my throwers do some of this stuff as well. The volume of what they do is usually about 50%. So when we're looking at, you know, the dynamic warm-up that I showed you previously, um, you know, again, the throwers aren't going to do as much. The drills, we're still on our phase two of our A and B package here. And then moving over here, <clears throat> excuse me, I need to get some water. But anyway, uh, we have our big, huge, monstrous workout of the week. Um, this is about as big as we go. This is very much in the tradition of the Clyde Hart long to short system. However, you'll notice as I go through these workouts, I don't do the same interval distances very often. Now, what we're going to talk about with the critical mass system, which I'm going to discuss in more detail uh, today as well in my live conversation, is that there's been data proven through a lot of research that training just above or just below your race distance, whatever your key race distance is uh, that you're training for is, actually has the highest carryover and correlation to improved sports performance. So in short, if you wanna get better at the 400, you have to race above it or train above it and train below it. So last week we talked about 350s, this week we're doing 450s. Now we have goal times that we want them to hit through the 400 that I have laid out here. Again, based off of their 200 meter PR. So if you're running a 26.9, <clears throat> the expectation is you're going to come through the 400, not the 450, the 400 uh, in one minute and 11 seconds. Then you carry on to the 450. So we have a cone at the 400 and at the 450. Um, that we put out there when we're doing these intervals so that you don't get the kids to shortchange the last 50. And the last 50 is going to be really brutal and it's going to be really tough. But it's this idea of finishing the race all the way through, knowing that you have the strength and have the confidence to be able to push through that distance. Um, and one of the things we find out a lot is we'll see athletes, they'll sprawl on the ground. I never let my athletes do that. I know you've probably seen pictures of people talking about being in the lactate war zone and they're all sprawled out and dead. We don't ever allow that. I get all of my athletes immediately up and we go have them stand over. we got a wall that's about shoulder height that we let them lean on. I don't mind them standing and leaning on a fence, leaning on a wall. I don't want them leaning on their teammates and I don't want them sprawled out rolling around on the ground. When it comes to grit and determination and things like that, when people tell you you've got to be mentally tough, the only way you get mentally tough is by going through tough experiences, coming out the other side and surviving it, and, and doing it in a way that it doesn't destroy the athlete, but it stretches their ability. We're constantly wanting to stretch, recover, and then stretch again. And what I mean by that is we want to go just a little bit above just a little bit below. Now, we don't do this every day. We do this once a week, maybe once every 10 days. We can do a workout like this, depending on the kind of system in which you want to run. Now, if you look at our distance program, we're doing the same thing, but with distance running. So we've got our mile repeats. We've got our, and we've got our different groups. We've got our big time group, our middle group, and our rookie group. And we base these paces, you know, off of what uh, is in the book that's uh, you know, Dr. Daniel's running formula and all that kind of stuff. 
And then we have a cooldown at the end that's rather large too. Now this is a big day. This would be a high week uh, of training in terms of this type of workout. Now, traditionally we have spring break on this week. I would use this as our big, huge workout of the week. And then we wouldn't do a lot after this week. So in other words, your volume is going to go down because usually we only train three days over spring break. We go Monday through Wednesday. So the days that we train, um, you know, we want to make sure that this one particular day is, you know, a rather large volume day. And then at the end of the week, we drop off our training where we don't even train. Now, when we move down here to our jumpers, you'll notice we have a number of jump activities that we're adding in. We're doing some acceleration runs, you know, through the runway. We're doing some short jump approaches, and then we're doing a horizontal series and high hurdle hops as well, plus some, you know, 150s. This is a high volume day for your jumpers. Now, if your athletes can't get through this or they start to look flat on their landings, because the landing for jumpers is the most important thing you want to pay attention to. You don't want to see big collapses. You want to see bounce, okay, from your athletes. Once they start to show you that they're losing that contractile pop, then you might have to cut some of this stuff out. But this is the plan, and you don't have to be wedded to the plan, but you have to have something in place to move your athletes through. Now, when we look at our 100-meter hurdlers or our 300-meter hurdlers, we also have a big day set up for our returning varsity kids and then our rookie kids. So there's two different workouts there for our hurdlers, and you notice this is a pretty big workout. You'll also notice that we have 12 hurdles set up here, 12. So what's happening here is that you're going beyond the 10 barriers into 12 hurdles in a row to train that athlete. So we're really stretching their ability. Even for your good 100-meter hurdlers, we set up two more hurdles at the spacing that we want farther down. So each rep, they're going longer and longer and longer. Now, why do we set up the 100 hurdles this way and we set up the 300 hurdles in reverse? So in the hundreds, we're going longer, where in the 300s, we're going shorter. Well, simply put, the 100 hurdles require a lot of rhythm. If your athletes can't maintain the rhythm through, just kind of like the jumpers, if they're not showing you that pop, that contractile, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a mess. You've got to cut the workout short. So the farther we get, the better. But if we can't maintain a good rhythm two reps in a row, we shut that workout down. Now, over here for our longer hurdlers, we're doing a similar thing, but we're doing it in reverse where we're going from longest distance for the first one to the shorter distances as we move through. Now, the other trick that I like to play here with this is we'll do half of the interval with hurdles and half of the interval with not hurdles, or we'll mix hurdles flat and then hurdles. Now, why do we do that? Well, for the 300 meter hurdles, it's all about rhythm not so much technique. You'll notice that in our program at Parkway Central, we have a lot better um, long hurdlers than we do traditionally short hurdlers. However, when I was riding the hurdle workouts a long time ago, we had four kids qualify for state four years in a row. So we were very lucky to have some talented kids and we had a good system in place and your athletes become some of your better coaches as well to demonstrate and model how things are supposed to look. Last year, I took over the hurdles again, so we're kind of in a unique situation um, there, but we did have a hurdler end up finishing all conference and had a huge drop in PRs, and a number of other girls did as well. So it was still an auspicious season, even though we had some rookies and some new kids who had not really done those events too often in the past. So with this, what we're trying to do is we're trying to break up that rhythm. We want them to be used to, you know, hurling with both legs. We want them to be used to dealing with different rhythms and different approaches. And so when things happen in the race, they've seen that before. And in addition, as they start to fatigue, we're cutting the distance down so that way the quality can be maintained over a shorter and shorter distance because these workouts can be pretty tough. We also put our hurdlers in spikes when they're doing short hurdles. With long hurdles, we don't always do that. I usually pick an every other day uh, situation for them to get spiked up, especially if we're doing long work. You don't want to blow their shins up and their legs up. Um, and then what we try to do with a workout like this is we try to match the volume 
of what they're doing on a long day if they're linked up. Now, why do we link up the days and we try to match things up so that the distance is a similar type of workout, but the distance, the jumpers are doing a similar type of day, but the jumpers, the 100 hurdlers and the 300 hurdlers are doing a simple type of day. Because a lot of times what happens, coaches and athletes, is when we share them, we share these really, uh, really cool athletes that can do a lot of different things. We want to make sure that they're getting a similar theme so that when they go maybe between, so if you have like a long sprinter or a short distance athlete and they're going between distance and sprinting, you want to be able to have the themes be linked up day to day, even if the workouts are different, so that the next day they're not doing the same type of workout that they did on Monday, but now for a sprinter or a distance game. If you put an athlete in that situation, you're going to blow them up. So what we try to do is we try to link up these workouts where they make sense, where they're tied together. So that way that doesn't happen. Now, specifically, looking at my program, this idea of the critical mass is, is very, very simple. And what we're trying to look at here is there are training modalities that make the most sense. So when we look at sprints, for example, and we're looking at a 200-meter female, you'll see correlations here where you see some indications that there's improved sports performance. Interestingly enough, you'll notice that some of the highest correlations of the non-running specific stuff comes from jumping, not lifting, not throwing. Now, you'll notice as the athlete gets faster, these correlations sometimes drop and some go up. So, for example, jumping from one leg to another, okay, over the 50 meters distance has a high correlation to improve sports performance all the way through ability levels. So that should tell you that that is something that your sprinters probably should be doing because it is a very, very, very high correlation, okay? Now, you'll notice that the shorter stuff doesn't seem to make as big of a difference. So for example, barbell snatch, actually as an athlete of this ability over time, shows that there's a negative correlation, which means the, poor, the performance is going to, according to this research, possibly get worse. Now, these correlations are small, so you might not be doing too much bad, but then you'll notice over here, okay, when they're slower, the squat helps a little bit more, you know, standing long jump helps a little bit more, right? But as the athlete gets faster, these are the types of things that we're looking at more for improved sports performance all the way through because it replicates what the athlete does. So when we look at the critical skills that an athlete has, once they get to a certain fitness level, we want to be repeating the things that are going to make them better on a regular basis. Now, on the other side of our chart here, you'll notice that if it's a 200-meter athlete, and these are the number of reps that they're doing, okay, you'll notice that the athletes do the best with the fewest amount of reps, but also reps that are nearest just above or just below their ability level. So you notice you've got a 728. 803 here, right? 680, 6745, 667, 752, right? And you'll notice as you move out to the farther and farther indices, they have less of a correlation to improve sports performance, right? So we've got, you know, right here, we've got six reps. This is five reps, four reps, three, two, and one, okay? And you'll notice as we move through the reps that are a little bit longer, okay, tend to have higher improve sports performance because they are more closely related to the event. So what's the point? If you want to get better at sprinting the 200 meter dash, you've got to race above or train above and race below and train below the particular best distance. So how do I implement that into my program? Well, first of all, I do it in practice where we have the reps that are above a 450 or a 350 or a 250 and a 150, depending on what type of sprinter they are. Same thing for a 100 meter person, 150 to 80s or 60 meters out of blocks, as you can see here, all right? But more importantly, okay, we wanna make sure that that's something that they do racing as well. No athlete owns an event. Every sprinter in my group will run a 100 and a 400. They'll run a four by one if they're good enough to take handoffs and they're in that 12 that I talked about last time, and they'll all run four by fours. 
And then, you know, we race through that so that we can figure out what is their very best event? Is it the 100, the 200, or the 400? Is it maybe the 800? Do they look like they're getting better as the event gets longer? There's nothing wrong with having that. And what that allows you to do as a coach is it shows to the athletes, they don't own an event. They got to keep working hard. There's no guarantee that they're going to race the particular race that they want to necessarily run. They're going to run the race that they're best able to perform and do the best through the district sectional and state series or whatever your qualifier is. And they're going to do what's best for their team. And it also reduces the negative things that can happen within your program where an athlete feels that they own it or they're entitled to that event where there's plenty of competition for the athletes to prove through their performance who actually deserves the event. So we do that in training. A famous athlete who's done that a lot throughout her career is Allison Felix. You know, for a long time, Allison Felix was looked at as a 200 meter specialist, but she's also, you know, been an Olympian in the 100 four by one. She's also been a world medalist in the four by four and the open four. So you're looking at that person and she's got a lot of range, but she's also raced a schedule like that to where, you know, she can go above and below and then come back to her specialty event of the 200. Bobby Kersey over the course of Allison's career had really done a lot of cool things to make that happen. And so that makes a lot of sense when you're looking at training. Now, in order to hit the times you need to have, you need to know your paces and repetitions. The one thing I want you to ignore here is the recoveries. These don't match up, but everything else about this. So if you have a girl that can run 54 seconds, first of all, congratulations. That's a really fast kid or a 23.7 or 11.5. This also shows you that this is where they should be. So an 11.5 kid should be able to run 23 something in the 200. should be able to run 54 something in the 400. If they can't do these things, then we're probably missing a piece of their training. And what's interesting is that if we work on improving this, this gets better. If we work on improving this, this gets better. But what's interesting is in working on this also improves this and improves this. So it works in both directions from left to right and right to left. Now recoveries, I usually like to do a minute per meter. Obviously that gets pretty crazy when we get up to this, right? Because that's a lot. So when we get to here, I don't usually go any longer than 15 minutes recovery but it needs to be pretty big because it's pretty, these are maximal efforts, right? 95%. The studies have shown if you can't go 93 to 95, you're not really improving absolute speed. We know that. However, this is percentage of effort of their best performance, not necessarily maximal speed. That's a completely different thing. But if you look at these charts, it will show you, okay, if I'm going to run two to three reps, uh, over 300 meters, and I've got a kid that I want to be this fast. Well, this is the time they have to hit. Now, what's interesting, right, is that I have a young lady in my program who has run, and this is what really stinks about our current situation, you know, has run really, really fast times that potentially could be somewhere in this ballpark before she's done in high school. Now, she's only a sophomore right now, and uh, it's not the it's not my 200 meter specialist. It's another kid that I have in my program. And so we were dialing in workouts that would eventually get us to this. You know. Now here's the other interesting thing about this. You have what's called date pace, which is what they've run to this point, and then you have what's called goal pace. So with goal pace, I always work the chart down. So like when you have this spreadsheet and you've got these different measurements of time. I always work down to the next time that I think they're at. So there's other charts than this in this book. There's like hundreds of them. It's a really cool book. It's called Running Tracks. Um, and it's not in print anymore, but a couple people have copies of it. So anyway, when you have these charts, you have what's called goal pace or date pace. Date pace is what they can run now. And that's going to change because weather, fitness, confidence, technical improvements that's going to change rapidly so when you get about halfway through your competitive cycle you should move to training from date pace to goal pace and goal pace for me is always going to be five percent or the next chart down so even though i don't have multiple charts up here let's say the athlete is training on this time right then you can move them up to this time now obviously that's not how we use these charts because this is just basically for reps but you get the point 
and we like to move to goal pace in practice, and we don't like to race, or excuse me, we don't like to train usually their reps at their distance. So if it's a 200 meter specialist, I like to train the 250 and the 150 because in practice, kids think they're very good. Some kids don't and they'll get mentally wrapped up and oh my God, I'm not running as fast as I raced last week. And it's like, yeah, because you're in training. It's different. You're not able to cover that distance in the same amount of time. So I like to race just below or just above. So that way the kid doesn't get in their head as much. They don't really know what those numbers mean other than the fact that they're getting better and you can show them that they're getting better because you keep good data, but we move them forward. So this is something that's really, really useful that I've found has helped a lot of my kids and my athletes out. Okay. Now, when we look at breakdowns of how you set up your workouts, this is my, what I would call my bumpers. Okay. My railways. I don't deviate too far from these when I put my workouts together. Now you'll notice that some of these volumes can get rather large. They can, but again, you're not going to start there, right? I always start at the minimums as kind of a rule, and then I'll work my way up. Remember, we go three weeks up, fourth week down, weeks up. But once I reach the critical mass, the critical amount of work that we would do for all of these particular type of workouts, I stay there. I don't move up and down too much. Same thing with um, your jumps. So as you move forward week to week to week to week, by the way, this is week one, week two, week three, week four, our jumps get more difficult and your contacts may come down because you're just not going to contact the ground as much, but our jumps become more difficult. So where sometimes these volumes get better in terms of amount, here the volumes go down, but the intensity of the technicality of the jump becomes higher. So putting this all together, we've got a bunch of different workouts that we could put together for this type of stuff. You have all sorts of different ideas. Um, I don't want to go into that too much today. I'll do that another time. But this is how you kind of reach the critical mass system. So there's this wave of work and volume and intensity that kind of rises. And you have this intense period where the volume then drops. And so you've reached this critical amount of work. Then what I like to do is switch to a different system where we're loading up, unloading, loading up, unloading, loading up, unloading, and repeat. And that way you have basically three themes going on each week as you go up. So you've got your speed week, your power week, your endurance week, your recovery week. And that's how we put that together. Speed, power, endurance, recover. And that's what you're seeing here. Speed, power, endurance, recover. Speed, power, endurance, recover. And that's once we've gotten through what we call our general preparation phase, which fits a little bit more like this and then becomes more like this as a, as a theme or a spirit of the training. Again, I usually will start off with a smaller volume and these things kind of climb together and then the volume will cut and the, and the intensity stays up and then we go to here. So these aren't exactly what I would do week to week, but they're in the spirit of what I would do. All right. I hope this has explained things to you guys and how to do it and how to put it together. Parkway Central athletes, you can do these workouts. They are not mandatory, obviously, because we're in a weird situation that we're in, but you can do this stuff on the roads. Use the times that I've given you as a guide if you're going to run on the road and um, do some stuff in your driveway or on the sidewalk. And Make sure that you guys can get those jumps in as well. If you can't run for some reason, then I would just move to the jumpers workout and try to do some of those activities to just keep yourself power and explosive. At the bare minimum, we want to be explosive. We want to be powerful. That's the most important thing. All right, guys, I love you. Be safe. Be smart. Wash those hands. Uh, if you got any comments, questions, or concerns, hit me up. If you want more videos like this, please go to my YouTube page, Bantasmo1978, or check out my book, The Sprinter's Compendium, which is on Amazon, and I've even got a free chapter on there as well. Um, but hit me up, guys. If you got any questions or things you want me to talk about in the future or explain this in more detail, I will. All right, guys. Peace.